Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome the next of our very special guests to our In Conversation With series. Um, today, we are joined by the wonderful Paula Harding, who is Executive Assistant to Sid Madge of me. And very interestingly, I have just asked Paula, what is me? So what, what, why, what's, why is it called, why is Sid's company called me? Okay, so me exists to inspire everyone, everywhere, every day to find, live and give their magic. The magic being the thing that makes you unique. And it's about helping people to realise their potential. Amazing. Oh, thank you so much, Paula. And it is absolutely wonderful to have the chance to welcome you. So I've known Paula now. Well, I say I've known her. We've, we've, I knew of Paula when I first created the PA forum. She was one of the people that I was told, you've got to speak to Paula Harding. And I followed Paula's journey for so many years, but we actually only met in person <laughs> last month, which was absolutely bonkers. So it's been nearly six years, um, but I have, have had the pleasure of getting to know Paula um over time and she's an absolute diamond and so it's amazing to have this opportunity to welcome her today and find out a little bit more about her so what we tend to do at the beginning of these interviews is ask you Paul I mean loads of people know you you're very well respected in the profession a lot of people have heard some of your your talks before whether that be interviews or or perhaps learning that you're sharing but can you share with us three facts about you that people might not know? Wow. <laughs> How long have you got, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, you know, middle-aged now, so, but I was born in the Isle of Man, which makes me a Manx person. So I lived there until I was 28, um, very sort of humble childhood, beautiful childhood, always out playing, um, just a beautiful island, just, you know, just a wonderful sort of upbringing, really. And I left there when I was 28 to move to Liverpool. So that's perhaps one thing that people don't know about me. And whilst I lived in the Isle of Man, when I was 19, I volunteered to sail on the Francis Drake. So it was the part of the Ocean Youth Club. And it was 16 people we'd never met before. And we all turned up one evening um, to this Francis Drake boat. There was two instructors, 16 people who'd never met. And um, that night, midnight, none of us had ever sailed before. We set off from the Isle of Man and we sailed to Scotland and all around different places in Scotland. And wow. yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was just a massive life-changing moment, I suppose. I mean, at the time it was, awful it was horrible we were sick we didn't know what we were doing it was hard work it was tiring we didn't wash for days um and it but looking back I just I always think wow what an achievement that 16 people who'd never met could sail a boat and live together and 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 all that you know that I come that sort of comes with that it just it was a huge achievement so proud how, of me. how long did that take Paula it was eight days. Eight days, wow. Yeah. So it must be very difficult to be thrust into that environment. You know, you enjoy, everyone's there for kind of enjoyment, but to actually, when you're on a boat together, there isn't anywhere else to go. Well, exactly. I mean, the first night that we set off, it was midnight. The sea was howling. It was really windy. The sea was really choppy. And they gave us each a turn on the wheel and the boat was just, this way, that way, and waves coming over us, and and they'd said that there was um, a tree trunk in the in the Irish Sea, and we had to look out for that, and um, we were all being sick, and um, yeah, it was. <laughs> when I look back, and I just think, wow, what was I doing? I just think, wow, I was so lucky to have had the opportunity, and and um, there were some beautiful moments, uh, you know, some nights when we were. But they had the anchor down and, and the sunset and we had like purposes, purposes swimming past us and it was just some magical moments, but a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. 
Wow, that's oh, incredible. Yeah, so the third thing that people don't know about me. Oh, I like to talk about when I was 25 that I had a nervous breakdown. And the reason I talk about that is when I had it and I lived on a small island, it was, I felt very ashamed, um, very much for stigma back then. And I felt very embarrassed about myself. And, you know, the th what you learn over, uh, over your life is that those are the things that, that help shape your life. And you can sort of make a difference with those things. And people like Frank Bruno, Alistair Campbell, Ruby Wax, very, you know, sporty people, clever people, very public people were talking about their mental health. And that really helped me lose the shame. And I felt if these great big strong people, these clever people had a nervous breakdown, that it was absolutely okay that I had. And so I didn't, so I'd lost that embarrassment and gave me the confidence to talk about it. So that it's just as normal as breaking a leg or being on uh, tablets for your blood pressure or, you know, it's physical health, it's mental health, it's yeah. exactly the same. And you, you've done such amazing work, you know, bringing that to the forefront, particularly for the profession. I mean, you introduced us to Nick Halston and we absolutely love him. <laughs> like he, he's like a marriage made in heaven, Paula. He's absolutely amazing. But again, what I always admire about you is particularly you know, with with your with the stories that you do talk about on social media it is your true vulnerable self and I think that is what is missing these days from social media is that people it can be quite regimented it can be quite tactical it can be quite you know achievement driven but you've always got to have that personal pinch in there. And I think you always do that, which is what I, I love because it just means that without even doing this interview today, I know you and mm -hmm. I think that's really important. So it's about seeing that person for, for who they really are. I mean, my mom always says, what's for you won't go by you. And I sort of live that in the, um, my true self, my my authentic self, and you don't like that if if it's not wanted, if it's you know if it's not for you, then I'm absolutely fine with that. And it took me a long while to get to that stage in my life. I always wanted to fit in at school. I always um, wanted you know to 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 have people around me. And and then as I got older, I realised I was all right on my own. And you know I actually love being on my own now. And and having the confidence to be yourself on social media brings about the opportunities that are right for you and I think in the past perhaps our profession was a bit guarded with their knowledge their skills because it you know you're afraid of the competition perhaps but over the years I've seen it change and everyone shares information and I absolutely think that should be encouraged because we are stronger together. As you know, I use one, one of my hashtags and, um, you know, why not celebrate other people? Why not be happy for people and wish them well on their journey? And isn't that what life's about? Yeah, I think, uh, like you say, it's what we would do if we saw that person exactly. or, you know, and it, it, social media for me it's really weird I like for example I use LinkedIn more than I use Facebook and more than I use Twitter and more than I use Instagram but it's where I feel like it's a space where I feel like I am absolutely 100 myself 100% my true self and that I'm not going to be judged really because I think you built it over years I think both of us have built up the trust in the people that see what we do and know that what we are doing is really authentic and that they want to and like you said they can either follow or unfollow yeah. and that's absolutely fine but no I, I think um I've always like I said I've always really admired that about you Paula so uh, I love and I love it I love watching your journey so keep going because we absolutely love it um but I, I want to take us back to where your career began so Obviously, you were just talking about how you moved over from the Isle of Isle of Man to Liverpool. So, was 
how did you when did you know or how did you become in a business business support role where did that first opportunity come to you yeah, I think going all the way back to school Daniel I had careers day I don't know about your experience careers day but for us it was you either went to the Barclays Bank or the Isle of Man Bank or the army were there and a few other people and, and I just wasn't really inspired by anything and I had no clue what I wanted to do not a clue and I remember the work experience board outside the chemistry um outside of the chemistry class I can still see it and with all the little cards on and I was just like looking at the what am I going to do so I picked this company um an insurance company to work in the office for a couple of weeks so I did that and I just met such a lovely group of people and they always then from that moment if I wanted any references they would always provide that and you know or a bit of advice so when I was at school leave, thinking about my GCSEs or completing my GCSEs I just knew I wanted to leave and get a job I didn't want to um, stay on and do A-levels or there was no way I was leaving the Isle of Man to go to university. No way. I was too scared. I was too, no way. I couldn't do that. I couldn't leave home. So, um, yeah, so me and my friend, we were looking in the local paper and um, once we got our GCSEs and I saw a job in an insurance company for an office junior and applied and I was just overwhelmed to get it. And so working as an office junior, I had to do everything. I had to know everybody. I had to deliver the post to everybody. And it was just that start, I suppose, of um, being social around other people. And from that, I moved into a customer service role and I wasn't very good at it. And not because I didn't get good service, but it just didn't light me up, if you like. And, but in, a couple of years into that, I had an opportunity to work in on, on a project to look at the IT uh, a couple of years before 2000, because they were worried that all the computer systems would fall over in the year 2000. So the, the, the project had started like many years before to get ready for it. So I sort of volunteered for that. And it gave me this new confidence that I could do other things and that I was good at other things. And then a role came up in the company as a training and development coordinator. And as part of that, I had to do a presentation. Now, I'd never done a presentation before. I was really young. Um, but one of the ladies I worked with, she gave me some great advice. So she said, right, there's three things. You tell them what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them. And then you tell them what you've told them. So I was like, whoa, is it that easy? <laughs> so I... I mean, anything I do in life, Daniel, I do it. I, I do loads of research. I put loads of effort into it. I always want to make my mum and dad proud. And um, so I've done loads of um, effort, quite loads of effort. And I was in a temping bowling team at the time. So I'd gone there and I'd asked to borrow one of the tempins. And so I brought that into the presentation. And um, yeah, so I was lucky enough to get the job. And being a training and development coordinator, I had to do a lot of organising. But I was at the heart of everything. So I was in the HR department. So people would come to our events. Um, I'd arrange it all. I'd set it all up. I'd get the feedback. And it, I just loved that whole world of being involved in, in sort of organising things. And it just gave me a new level of confidence to sort of go out and seek other opportunities. Amazing. And I think, do you think that's where uh, that... That advice that that lady gave you, can you say that for us again? What did sure. she say? So she said, there's three things. You tell them what they, you're going to tell them. Yeah. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. I love that. I think that's, I <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant. I think that's great. And it uh, now I'm just thinking about it in my head when you're, to, when you're thinking about presentations and, and putting that into practice. That's actually, it's really, it's really good. And that helped you. Um, and what was your confidence like when you, when you had to give that presentation? How did you feel? Oh, I was, I was super nervous. I think my hands must have been shaking. Um, but I just knew inside that this was an opportunity that, and I had to get this job. It's, I needed it. 
Um, and I, I think that's something that my parents sort of instilled in me. You know, we we weren't a rich family, but I was loved. And but I was always told if I, you know if I wasn't well, not if I wasn't well, but if I wasn't confident about going to school, I had to go into school. Um, you know, they just set a really good example about hard work and. So I just sort of, you know, you just have to dig deep in those moments when it's a bit tough when you're a bit out of your comfort zone. Um, and I just knew I wanted this job more than anything. So I sort of just went for it. And But I was completely nervous. And do you think that working in that role within the, tra- within the training department, do you think that ignited your passion for learning and development then? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I loved, I loved ordering the equipment. I loved getting the slides ready, liaising with the trainers and thinking about what um, we were going to put on that year, getting everybody's development plans in and planning out, you know, um, all the manuals and what we were going to do and that whole sort of vibe of people coming in because they they wanted to grow and develop and and just being part of that whole improvement of people side and it was just lovely to be part of and being the organizer of it and getting great feedback saying oh that was a really organized um event well done and yeah I just yeah I suppose it, I never thought about it before Daniel but yeah definitely amazing and what would you from there then sort of or and and kind of moving into the next stages of your career what would you say has been one of the biggest challenges that you've had to face so far and 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 how have you overcome that challenge as well? Yeah, gosh. Um, I suppose I've always been up until about seven years ago. I had always felt like a failure. Um, I, you know, the, a couple, a lot of people I went to school with were very clever, had their own businesses, um, or you know, working in successful careers. And I suppose I, I felt at the time that my career being an admin wasn't successful, which I don't, which I don't um, now. And I'm passionate about that now. But at the time I did. And so I suppose that whenever anyone asked me what I did, I sort of went, well, I work in an office and, you know, and I sort of didn't really communicate that very well. When I was 23, Three, I think and moved to a HR role I'd applied for it before and hadn't got it and then when that person left they contacted me and said you know we you were quite close to the, the time before would you come come back so I went to work for a manufacturing company in the Isle of Man and I just thought wow this is my new career I'm going to get qualified in HR it's going to be amazing and I finally found my thing and there was two companies uh, one was the, a family owned two companies and they shared the factory in one, one, one side and one the other side. And there was this time when they said, right, we're closing this company. We're going to make everyone redundant. And I don't know if you know me, Dad, I'm such an emotional person. I just couldn't cope with that. I just thought that was horrible. And we had to do secret, you know, sessions of working out their redundancy payments before we told them and before it got out in the press and um, it was just a horrible time and I had to stand up in front of them while we told them the news. And these were my neighbors, these were people I lived with in the, in the small community. And um, one of them was my best friend's husband and I couldn't tell them. And when we did tell them, as you can imagine, lots of people said to me, why didn't you tell us or, and I just, again, another moment of shame and uh, it was really hard. And around that time, I d- it wasn't the cause, but around that time, that's when I had my nervous breakdown. So it was, and I felt like I'd failed in my, you know, I thought this was going to be my next career and, um, and making people redundant. And I just thought the world was out to get me and I was a horrible person and I was being punished. and. Um, and I was never going to be a success. All these kind of thoughts, which led to the sort of breakdown. And how how would you say? Obviously, you know, I I I I, I 
when I think about COVID, for example, and on all the redundancies that have been made and the, the people, I mean, I, you know, I was made redundant and yeah, I was, I was angry and I was upset and I was thinking, why me? And, you know, can I not, what can I do to try and, and stay? And you try, you, you try to understand, you, we take it, we take it so personally, but it's, so difficult sometimes you know for those businesses to make those decisions and I suppose that's where you know that confidentiality around you've had to hold that on your shoulders and normally it's for quite some time before people are told as well and you're having to go around and act like everything's okay not say anything at all um and that's why then it comes to a surprise to people when they when you know um, about it, but it's your job and you've got to try and separate that personal feeling that you've got from that job. But when you're so passionate about something, that's sometimes impossible to do. Mm-hmm. And so you take that emotion and you hold that on your shoulders and it can be just so overwhelming, mm-hmm. and particularly like you said, from a community that you you know so well. But you've come so far through that Paula that how have you how have you how did you start to rebuild your confidence again I believe in I believe in things like the law of attraction Daniel in serendipity things are meant to be and I really believe I was put through that for a reason Mm. and um I sort of went on then to sort of find myself again if you like what career was I going to follow but because I'd sort of lost my job through being having the nervous breakdown when I came back when I started getting well and I started looking for a job I had a role which didn't pay as much and I was saving for a house now my property prices were you know you can imagine a really high so I just thought well, I'm never going to get a house and so I took a part-time job in the evenings and through the part-time job, I met a gentleman who was over from um, Liverpool for the TT, uh, TT week in the Isle of Man. And I used to go over to Liverpool to see him. And when I was in Liverpool, I felt free. I felt nobody knew me. Nobody knew where I'd worked. Nobody knew I'd had a nervous breakdown. And I could work, walk into a shop and nobody say, how are you? and oh have you heard such and such and I just loved the freedom that it gave me and I thought well I'll move to Liverpool and if I don't like it I'll go home and I never went home Um, wow yeah it just it just gave me a new life a new start Uh, you know it wasn't all tickety boo to begin with you know I still had some of the illness and um, I found it hard being away from my loved ones. You know, it wasn't all plain sailing and rosy, but um, the freedom that it gave me mm. meant more at that time. I mean, it's an incredibly vibrant city. I mean, I look at Liverpool sometimes compared to Birmingham, and I mean, I'm, I'm just talking from from my point of view. I love the nightlife in Liverpool. I think it's fantastic. Such a shame in Birmingham we don't have, I, I, we do have a really vibrant LGBTQ plus community, but in Liverpool, I used to love going to Garland's, Paula. It was like one of the best clubs I've ever been to. <laughs> but I, what I also loved is that you just went and everyone was so welcoming it's one of I think the best cities in the world I love Liverpool it's got a massive massive place in my heart so I hope everyone was as welcoming uh, to you when you first got there well, as well. The, the gentleman I was with he he was one of um, 10 brothers and sisters yeah. and everybody apart from him had children so yeah. we were never in we were always at somebody's house on his birthday christening wedding you know, unfortunately, um, or the kids wanted to see us because we were the only two without kids. They wanted to spend their time with us because we would have them at our house or, um, you know, it, it was just, and they really introduced me to Liverpool. You know, I, I got to see so much of Liverpool through them. And um, yeah, it just, I just loved oh. it. So <laughs> obviously it's, it's, it. so when, when did this, uh, when did the opportunity arise for the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine? How did that, when did that opportunity arise for you? 
gosh, that was, I'm saying seven years ago, can't quite remember Daniel. <laughs> 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 but, um, I, yeah, oh, so I worked for, I worked for Public Health England and I worked for um, the regional health director and um, he decided to retire and he paid for me and my partner to go to India to his daughter's wedding and it was, and I just, we just got on so well and when he retired, I thought, well, I'll start looking for something new and I got the first job that I applied for and I went for it and it just didn't work out. So then I went back to temping. I've done a lot of temping in my life and I'm so grateful for it. The opportunities they gave me, the people I got to work with, um, you know, the lessons I learned, the systems learned, the skills learned. And so I went back temping and I started in a company which was okay. And then I moved roles within that business because they wanted to keep me on when that came to an end. And I was so unhappy, Daniel. And it just, it was, yeah, just, it wasn't happy. And I ha after a couple of years, I just had to leave and I had no job to go to. I mean, I used to go come home crying most nights. And um, I just thought, right, I'm gonna take a couple of months off. I'm gonna go for a walk every day, I'm gonna get healthy. And so I did that. And then after about a week, I had a call from an agency to say, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine looking for an EA, would you go for the interview? And I was like, yeah, everybody in Liverpool wanted to work for Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. I was like, yes, of course I want to go for the interview. And then I sort of, over time, over the next couple of days, I thought, oh my God, I've got holidays coming up. I can't mess them about. So I phoned them up and I said, look, I'm not sure. And she said, hang on, shall I phone the client? So she phoned the client and said, yep, they still want to see you. So I went for the interview, got the job. And yeah, I mean, it's a life changing decision. Wow. And what was it? What was it like when you when you first started there? So like, talk us through the first. What was your first couple of days like? I mean, I I honestly don't know how I got the job because um, the lady who I was going to be covering for was covered all the committees, and she had and I you know I hadn't really done that much committee work, but. When I first started, I had a day's handover with a Daniel, and she was in charge of the Finance and Investment Committee, the Borg, the trust, uh, Board of Trustees meetings, um, Nominations and Governance Committee. She had the Director of Strategic Operations to manage, and um, she managed the AGMs, everything. She's got a huge role. And I and on, had a day's handover. So obviously, I I had to find out everything for myself. I had to throw myself into it in terms of attitude, resilience, um, having to ask people for advice and, I, you know, working lots of extra hours. And I just threw myself into it. And at the time, it was the hardest job I'd ever had. Um, but it grew from it. And the Director of Strategic Operations recognised that in me and valued what I did and when it was time when she came back the EA he went to the director's office and said you know we need to keep Paula on and that's how I sort of progressed within LSTM and I uh, worked in the director's office for a bit and then I worked for the four heads of department and when the newly appointed dean of education started they asked me to go and support him so that was the last role I had there working for him. Wow uh, how, how many EAs or, or business support the staff do you think were in the organization do you know like how no, was, was it EAs, no no EAs there was about eight yeah um I bought <laughs> my Sid always laughed when I go bought um there was <laughs> because of the work that they do there's so many projects going on in different areas of research and there's an awful lot of business support staff I mean just they all, all the teams have that because they can't do it without them. Yeah. And what, how, when you went there, was it, was it quite, were a, a lot of the departments working in silos or in terms of the, was there an EA network, so to speak, in place or? Yeah. No, no, there wasn't an EA network in place. Um, what the, 
the I say girls because they are all girls, but the girls were are all so close. You know, they've, they've got each other's back, and um, you know, even now there's a WhatsApp group, and I'm still included on it, and yeah, uh, we meet up for socially now and again. So yeah, it yeah, no, it's I think due to the nature of the work, it is siloed because they have everybody's got their projects they're working on. Yeah. Um, so everyone's sort of like got a different strategy, if you like. Um, so, so when did you when did you start to go out and start networking as an executive assistant? Okay. Well, so when I was working for the director of strategic, strategic operations, <laughs> he <laughs> he, I couldn't believe the feedback I was getting from him, and. As I said to you earlier, I used to think that I was a failure, Daniel. And I had this light bulb moment working for him, and I thought, I'm not a failure. I'm actually quite good at what I do. And I thought, gosh, well, I love being EA, and I'm good at being an EA. And I thought, right, I'm going to make myself the best assistant that I can be. And that wasn't a competition with any other EA. It's about me. It was about, if I'm going to do something, how can I do that to the best of my ability? And so that took me on this journey of learning and growing, finding conferences and finding networking opportunities. And as part of that, I started going to the John Haynes International Coaching Academy in Liverpool. And sadly, John's no longer with us. He passed um, just over a year or so, or more now. Um, but this man changed my life. He he just, he was just this massive ball of energy and we'd go into his sessions every week and he'd make us stand up and he'd make us say what our purpose was or what was our music inside. And I didn't know when I first started going. And he'd say, come on, Paula, what is it you want out of life? You know, is it a business? Do you want success? Do you want money? I'm like, John, I don't want any of those things. I said, I'm just, I love being an EA. I love being the number two. I love being the one that helps people achieve. And, and, and I sort of realized, you know what? I actually, I'm going to go out and I'm going to tell everybody how amazing EAs are. And I'm going to make myself the best EA I can be. And, and I realized that if I felt like that, then perhaps others did. And I thought, I'm going to go out there and look people in the eye, say I'm an executive and encourage others to, to have that sort of sense of self-worth because we are the people which keep businesses going. Mm. And I just needed to get that message out. And through John, he gave me the skills. I mean, he encouraged us to network. He encouraged us to sort of really sort of own what you wanted and, and not be embarrassed by that. And he had us all speaking every week. He had us like, coaching each other every week and shouting our affirmations out. I mean, we we were in this building a couple of floors up with the windows open and he, we had to jump up and down and shout our affirmations really loud. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I mean, he'd tell us a story at the start. He always started with a story. And then he, because he believed in accelerated learning. So we had to do something fun then in between to get the, the knowledge from our left side of our brains to the right hand side. So we'd have to throw toys at each other and ask each other questions about the story. And it was just this most vibrant time every week. And I loved it. And um, wow. really in my life. Yeah. He sounds just like an amazing, amazing person. And that energy, you just feed off that energy, don't you? And that, and what I love is, is when you're talking about, you know, where you were before, where you didn't want to talk about that you were an ad, that you were working in an administrative role, to now going, I want to go out there and tell everyone I am an EA and this is what I do and this is what I love to do and that's what I love. You know, I think that's that's fantastic. So that when you started networking, did you would you say you started to develop your networking skills then uh, with all those different people from from there? Or yeah, I mean, there's different types of networking. Isn't it? We network when we go and work for a new organisation. You're going up, you're going up to people you've never met before and talking to them all the time. But 
people put networking into a category of I'm going out to a networking event, but we're always networking, aren't we, Paula? I mean, yeah, absolutely right, Daniel. That's a great point. I remember working at Shop Direct Group and I remember um, just, I was just friends with everybody. So I knew the facilities manager, I knew the HR manager. I was really friendly with the, we had like a Costa coffee and, you know, just if I ever needed anything, I knew I could get it because I built those relationships with people. And it's like, that's a really great point, Daniel. You don't have to be at a networking event to network. It's every single person you meet. And what I suppose in the traditional sense, networking, the PA hub in Liverpool. And I remember the first time I walked in there, I was so nervous. I couldn't breathe. And I, I walked up to Marion and I said, I don't know anybody. Okay, I'll, I'll introduce you to some people. And every single part of me just wanted to leave. I wanted to run away. And, you know, so that, and, you know, and still today, when I go to a networking event, I still get that, oh God, who am I going to talk to? Am I going to be boring? Oh my God. And then by the time I come away, I'm like, wow, that was a great time. And I loved it. And I've made new friends. And, um, but the, the, what John taught us was when you go networking, it's not about you, it's about them. So when you're talking to people, be a giver, you know, give them your time, give them, you know, listen to them, um, work out how you can help them. And it might not be the next week that you can help them, but it's something in the future that you'll remember from that conversation. So John always said, imagine a sign around somebody's neck that says, make me feel important. So, you know, really find out what's important to people. And it doesn't have to be about business. It could be that, you know, or they'd really like their child to, you know, to join a um, join a football group or something. And the next week you might meet somebody who's organising football groups and you go, oh, I know somebody and you connect them. And it's just a joyous feeling being able to connect people just because you took the time to listen. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that feeling, like you say, you know, um of walking into room marion and john for example that welcoming hands you know guiding you into the room is just so important they didn't leave you to your own devices and think oh god you know i mean i i love i i hate i i hate absolutely like you paula i hated networking when i was uh you know, but now i i went to a networking event the other week and i thought why am i here i i was thinking I, I was thinking I don't know what I'm doing here and I don't, I've kind of lost my way a little bit in terms of networking because I'm used to being in our bubble of the PA networks and going to the different professional events etc but I actually just went to a, a normal networking event for lots of different businesses that I'd never been to before and I just felt quite overwhelmed which was really strange but how are you with networking now? Are you, do you feel like you're, are you back since COVID? Are you back, you know, obviously I saw you at the Learning and Development Conference. It was fantastic watching you, you know, catch up with people that you've met before and people you've seen online or people that you've spoken to previously. But how are you, how do you feel about networking now? As I sort of, as I just touched on Daniel, I, when I'm there, I love it. And when I've left, I've loved it even more yeah. but I still get that sense of not dread as in I don't want to go just am I going to be boring are people going to like me um I won't have anything to say um but I always know there's an opportunity out of it and there's something that's going to happen because of it and I that overrides that fear of going and also you know to support other people if people are putting on an event you know it's taking the time to go in, you know, support them in that. And you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what opportunities are going to come out of a conversation. And I just think that's magical. It is. It's like, a, you, you never know what the start of a different, different relationship will bring, you know, which is fantastic. So obviously um, we were talking about earlier about you being a huge ambassador for learning and development and always follow your hashtags better together never stop learning add value etc so 
you've also been very successful, Paula, in delivering lots of different sessions. I know you've spoken a lot for all the different PA networks and you've, you've spoken at Lucy Brazier's um, global conference as well before. So how did you, how did you start to put all the, all the is this your lived and life experiences that you're sharing um, with us? For me, Daniel, when I do anything in life, if it's um, a social media post or a presentation, it's about adding value. Mm. So it's about asking, so what? What, what am I doing it for? It's, if I write a social media post, it's not about, hey, I'm at this event, look at me. It's like, I'm at this event and here's what I learned. Um, or here I'm at this event and this is a brilliant space. Have you thought about using this space? You know, giving something back. And, and I think that sort of lends itself into my presentations as well. It's about, well, so what? It starts with thinking about why am I giving this presentation? What is the point of it? What are people going to get out of it? Um, what's the outcome you want for people? As with anything, when I'm networking, on social media, when I'm doing a presentation, it's got to be authentic, Daniel, because there's no other point in doing it. It has to mean something to me. It has to be truthful. Um, so when I'm doing a presentation, I'll only write about things that are important to me or I know something about or I can add value in. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I could write about a ton of things, but that, that wouldn't be authentic to me, you know? And I think that's when you get the value is when the passion for it comes out and the, um, the authenticity and you sort of, yeah. I suppose, like you say, that lived experience. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What would you say, which is the kind of, what are the sorts of topics that you like to talk about, Paula, through your learning when you're delivering learning? I think it's the things that I'm learning about and growing with. So I talk a lot about influence. So I really see that as a key part of any sort of um, toolkit, if you like, you know, it's such an important part of what we do. And I think because I've been learning about that over the last sort of seven or eight years that I can really authentically talk about it. And, you know, how do you make yourself a better assistant? So, you know, I talk about asking questions. Um, I talk about using social media. Um, Loads. Networking. It's just all those things about how you make yourself a better assistant. Yeah. And, those are the things that I feel add value to the people that I engage with. Amazing. Um, so we know that you've been working now with Sid for 10 months. So how did how did that opportunity come to light as well for you? Mm. So um, as I said to you before, I believe in the law of attraction. I believe in serendipity. Um, and... And not long before, actually, um, my colleague at work, so as I say, you know, we didn't have a network, but we're quite sort of friendly with each other. My EA friend at work had put on a, an online vision board group. So, um, so we were all online putting our vision boards together. And at the heart of my vision board was that I wanted to work for the founder of a business. I wanted either the founder or the CEO, I wanted to be working for the person that can make the decisions, who said, we're doing this and we're doing it now. Um, and I sort of put it out there that that's what I really, really, really wanted. So then um, one, just before Christmas, just before um, Lucy Brazier had done the advent calendar competitions, and normally, because I was out a lot at the time and I was invited to a lot of events and a lot of training events and stuff, I, I didn't sort of go in for the big prizes for the training events because I thought, you know, I get to go to enough anyway. But I don't mind applying for the smaller competitions. You know, if I win one of them, I won't feel bad. <laughs> and so I entered the one of the days to win a set of books from Sid. And um, in, I think it must have been in between Christmas and the New Year or New Year, I found out I'd won a set of books. And Sid sent the books and he sends them with a handwritten postcard. And it just had that most beautiful message on a great big 
uh, signature or the smiley face and it really sort of touched me and I thought wow that's so such a lovely thing to do so I wrote back to him to say thank you um, but it turns out instead of offering one book he actually sent out then after that he sent out 20 sets which I thought was a really lovely thing to do but wow. yeah I know he's so generous and so I wrote back to say thank you and he sort of he started following my social media posts because every single page of these books so there's three books and every single page is a chapter and I find reading a whole book really hard so I love these books and every chapter was like a social media post and I was just like wow that would make a great post wow that would make a great post and um, so I did like a social media post about these books so Sid started following me and then he invited me to be on his podcast. So I went on his podcast and I was like, yeah, of course I'll be on your podcast to shout about how amazing EAs are, any opportunity. And, you know, in between those conversations when we weren't recording, we sort of found out that we were very similar, wanted to make a difference in life. Um, and at the time, my other executive hadn't said it worked, but he told me he was going to be retiring. So, um, you know, Sid and I said, well, let's keep in touch. And when he does, think about you joining the business. And my exec retired and then I joined Sid. Wow. And all of that, obviously, that happens during the, obviously, when we were just coming out of the pandemic as well. So you're at that sort of stage where you're thinking, oh, do I move? Do I not move? But obviously, with, I think there's quite a few people that I know at the moment who are probably in a very similar position to you, Paula, where they're thinking my executive is retiring next year or the year after. What's my plan? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And but that's, working that's with an entrepreneur. I was just going to say yeah, that's absolutely. really sort of helps because then you know people you can sort yeah, of absolutely. But with the uh, working for an entrepreneur, how is the, what's the difference what's it like because obviously a lot of the your work experience you've been you know in in different organizations working and supporting different departments or senior execs etc so is it is it you and you consider the team so you consider the the partnership what is that partnership what's what's it like working for an entrepreneur i mean i mean i said to you i said to you daniel it was on my vision board i really wanted it but i didn't know what i was getting myself into and, and I can tell you today, 10 months later, I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's been a journey of growing because Sid is off the chart. He's always on the go. He's always, he's tenacious. He's got tons of ideas. He's, he wants to achieve, he wants to make a difference. And, you know, it took me a while to catch up with him because I would think I was asleep when I joined him. And so it's just been a massive journey of growing and, but now 10 months later god i just love i love the fact that he says something and we do it um if something isn't working we change it we do something else he's just so resilient he's just so adaptable um and he's got a massive heart daniel to make a difference everything we do is about helping people reach their potential and and I suppose that sort of suits my personality. That's what I want out of life. And to have this opportunity to work with a man who's so ferociously ambitious <laughs> about achieving that is it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic to see your relationship grow. And we can see that over on, on social media as well. So no, it's fantastic, Paula. And just as we kind of come to the end of our time together today, what would, what's the future for you, Paula? What does the future hold for you? You said about this vision board and that you wanted to work for a founder, but what, where, what's your future? What, what, what would you like to see for you in the future? Yeah, I, I think if, you, if I hadn't have met Sid, my answer would have been very different. You know, it would have been like, I wanted to be the best EA for myself and blah, blah, blah. But working with Sid, such an opportunity to make a difference to inspire people to realize their potential you know some of the students that we meet they're checking in with us with the word numb they're leaving us with the word courageous and it on honest to god it just changed it's just so beautiful and and one child that um one student i say child 
in the 20s. One student we worked with um, was born blind and really it had an impact on us that our resources weren't suitable for her. So we've had one of Sid's books turned into Braille. Wow. The opportunity to get involved in things like that. I can only see my future with me, the business me and Sid, and, and doing that. But at the same time, banging the drum of the EA community, but having time to spend with my family, because my family are so important to me. Um, and that's my success. It's making a difference, celebrating my community and being with my family. Amazing. And what what three pieces of li- what three nuggets of, of advice would you give to those watching us today before we, we wrap up, Paula? From from you, what would you Ooh. I know it's a difficult one. <laughs> I'd say be a giver. You know, always want the best for people. Through the work that we do at me, it's find the magic in other people. You know, be there for people truly listen to people you know when you're with people make them feel important make them feel valued and just go and live your best life what yeah. is the life that's best for you don't be worrying about anybody else just live your best life amazing paula it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much and congratulations to you on everything that you've achieved i think it's incredible and we can't wait to see where the fu- what the future holds for you as well. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, everybody, for listening today. It's wonderful to welcome you. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.